Mr. Durst is present with his lawyers, Mr. DeGaron and Mr. Chesnoff. And we have uh, Mr. Lewin, Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Milius, Mr. Miata, and Mr. Henderson for the people. Did I say Bailey? He's here too. And uh, so, Mr. DeGaron, will you be giving the uh, I will, Your the Honor. argument? Chesnoff will start next week. No, we're not going to wrestle again, though, Your Honor. Okay, because <clears throat> that was my favorite part of the whole trial was Thank to you. wrestle. All right, uh, let's. Uh, so, Mr. DeGaron, you may you may address uh, the jurors for the first half of the defense argument. May I please the court? Yes. Members of the prosecution. Roaches in the soup. Really? Body parts. Nine days of beating up on a sick old man that can't defend himself. Calculated to cause you to hate him. And I wouldn't blame you after seeing what you've seen in this courtroom. For hating Bob Durst. I don't. I've known him for 20 years. And I am proud. I am proud to stand before you and defend Robert Durst when almost no one in the world would do so but me and my small team, my friend David Chesnoff, my friend Chip Lewis. Our sick friend Don Ray who has not been able to be with us. and Lauren Childress with her new twins. If you recall a year and a half ago when we started this, not knowing what our fates held for us, we asked you then to pay attention to what we thought was going to be a four-month orde ordeal that's now turned into a year and a half. You didn't sign up for it, but you didn't have much choice. And thank you for being here. But I wouldn't blame you after hearing what you he heard for these five months if you hate Bob Durst and believe he's a liar. But making Bob Durst a liar does not make him a killer. They have to bring evidence, whether it's direct evidence or circumstantial evidence, and there's no direct evidence. This case is about Susan. Objection. That misstates the evidence. Over. There's no direct evidence. That's a misstatement Over. of the evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, the attorneys in making these arguments to you are commenting on the testimony you heard, then the evidence that was presented in this case, they're remembering the evidence as it was presented. If their recollection of what the evidence is differs from your recollection, you must follow your own recollection. These arguments are not construed as evidence in the case or instructions on the law. You may continue, Mr. DeGaron. This is a circumstantial evidence case. Your Honor, I'm going to, the, Your Honor, we need to briefly approach. No. Mr. DeGaron may continue. And the court tells you that circumstantial evidence is as good as direct evidence. But he also tells you that if the circumstantial evidence 
leads you to more than one conclusion, only one of which is guilt. You must, as your duties tell you, as your oath tells you, you must find the accused not guilty. This case is supposed to be about Susan Berman. But we heard months and months of evidence about a case in Galveston in which I represented Bob Durst, in which 12 good citizens found him not guilty on more evidence that you, than you heard here. You heard only part of the evidence in Galveston. The prosecution set its own goal. Mr. Balian said it pretty succinctly yesterday. Their goal and what they must prove to you is that Bob Durst killed Kathy Durst and Susan Berman made the call to the dean. And unless they prove that to you, their case is over. So what I want to talk to you about is the efforts they've gone to to demonize Bob Durst so that you will overlook the weakness of the evidence about Susan Berman, the only verdict that you can write in this case, which is about Susan Berman. I said it's my honor and I'm proud to represent Bob Durst when very few would do so. As you know, um, for some 25 years I've taught law school at the University of Texas. I've taught young law students and try to inspire them with the honorable profession of representing the citizen accused against the massive power of the state. You know, those of us who follow that profession wouldn't win any popularity contests in the public because I know that often the public associates the lawyer with whatever the client is accused of doing. And so the lawyer is just about as bad in the eyes of the public. And so I have to live with that. And so I have to tell my students, you have to live with that. But it still is an honorable profession. So, I want to talk to you first about how I first came into the case and what, as the evidence shows, we found and what we presented in Galveston. In my opinion, based on the evidence, Galveston shouldn't be in this case. The judge tells you what how to judge other crimes evidence, other offenses evidence, it's in the charge, and how, what limited purposes you can have for it. But in my opinion, it's here to prejudice you. Simple. Yes, Your Honor, that's an improper argument. Number rule. It's, this is argument, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take it for anything but that. It's an argument. My opinion from the evidence is it's here to prejudice you. 
It's a terrible case. It's terrible what Bob did to Morris Black's body. And those pictures are awful. I know some of you turned away from them. Some of you couldn't look at them. They're that bad. But what we had in Galveston was a jury that was intelligent enough, intellectual enough, to realize and to separate what happened to Morris Black's body after he was dead from the manner in which he died. I'm sure it wasn't easy. It's not easy for you. But the truth is, nothing that Bob Durst did to Morris Black's body after Morris Black was dead could change how Morris Black died. And the evidence was clear in Galveston. that Morris Black died from a single accidental gunshot to the head after a struggle over the gun. There was tons of evidence. There was so much evidence, and you can see it in some of the little tags on the evidence that are in, in evidence before you that the evidence numbers ran into the multiple hundreds Donner, of pieces of evidence. Of court. Yeah. Donner, we need no. a sidebar. No, 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 we not have a sidebar, but I'll sustain. <clears throat> you may argue the evidence, but you may not argue that, Mr. Well, Garrett. <clears throat> I want to make clear what I'm saying. In the evidence that you've seen, there are tags on many of the pieces of evidence. Each one of those tags are numbered, and they're in the hundreds. There were bags that were recovered from Galveston Bay, a bay that's so shallow you can walk uh, half a mile and the water's not up to your thighs. In those bags, in addition to Morris Black's legs and arms and torso, was evidence that pointed directly back to Bob Durst. Evidence that pointed directly back to Morris Black. Evidence that pointed directly back to the, uh, we call it a duplex, it's actually a fourplex, but the evidence that, that directed the police directly back to that place on Avenue K. And it wasn't for a couple of days as they gathered all that evidence that the police realized what they had and they went immediately to Avenue K and in the trash can there in the alley they found multiple pieces of further evidence. Blood, documents, a receipt from a, uh, an ophthalmologist, optometrist, excuse me, with Bob Durst's name on it. The gun, it's in evidence here. The 22 Ruger target pistol that Bob Durst bought in his name 
at a gun store in Pasadena, Texas, which is adjacent to Galveston and Galveston Island. And in that, uh, along with that gun, was a single fired shell cartridge and two clips that went to that gun. One of the clips had one less bullet in it. They didn't find the head. But what they did find was a bag that was triple bagged with a large slit in it and it had blood on the inside of that bag. The evidence is convincing that that's the bag that held the head. That bag was in the bay. All the other body parts were in other bags. There was nothing for blood to get there was nothing to have blood on it to get in that empty bag except the head. And that bag was found in the water. As far as the evidence is concerned, what, really what's happened here is the prosecution has tried to get a do-over of that trial. They even call the same blood spatter or splatter expert. Frankly, I think, in my opinion, it's junk science, but he agreed. He agreed with what the police found, the blood spatter on the kitchen wall, which was so minuscule, apparently, when Bob was mopping up and cleaning up, he didn't see it and didn't clean it up, and it was there. And it was Morris Black's blood. And it described a pattern on the wall like it would as, as if it were a cone that had been uh, transected diagonally. In other words, an oval shape. And Mr. Bevel testified here that he hadn't seen the reenactment or the, the video uh, well you know what I'm talking about <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue no, I apologize but <laughs> Animation, thank you. He said he hadn't seen it during the trial uh, because they didn't call him back. The prosecution didn't call him back. And Mr. Bailey, and I believe it was, asked him, well, did the, did the uh, defense ask you to look at it again? Well, no, we didn't ask him to look at it again. He said he'd looked at it again. And he emailed, you remember this? He emailed Mr. Lewin saying that it was consistent. That what we said about it was consistent. Now he backtracked on the witness stand, but he couldn't backtrack out of that email. And what that video showed was the struggle. Now there's argument, uh, Mr. Balian says or Mr. Lewin says that, well, the hand's on the gun wrong, and uh, but no. You know, when there's a death struggle over a gun, things happen very, very rapidly. And when you're in a death struggle over a gun, or you believe you're in a death struggle over a gun, and you grab the gun, and you, and you fall to the floor, and the gun goes off, well, then everything is moving. 
your hands, your your body, your elbows. Uh, what was important in Galveston is that Bob Durst's finger was not on the trigger. Morris Black's finger was on the trigger. And he had to have the safety off or it wouldn't have gone off. That's what happened in Galveston. And a jury unanimously agreed and found him not guilty. And yet here we are trying the case again. <coughs> Different standard of proof, as the judge tells you. It's a preponderance of the evidence. But there is no place on the verdict form for you to find Bob Durst guilty of murdering Morris Black. It's, in my opinion, there, here, to prejudice you against Bob Durst. And the worst part of, of it, of course, is the dismemberment, because it is gruesome, it's awful. And I just have to ask you to please don't let your emotions rule your logic. What I have to ask you is to please understand that nothing that Bob Durst did with Morris Black's body could change the way that Morris Black died or what happened. And the jury in Galveston found him not guilty. Don't let it prejudice you. It also happened nine months after Susan Berman's death. The theory of the prosecution is that Morris Black found out that Bob Durst was Bob Durst. But Bob Durst didn't have anything to worry about anymore. If you accept the prosecution's theory that Bob Durst's motive for killing Susan Berman was to shut her up, she died December 23rd, 2000. She's dead nine months before Morris Black meets his death. It doesn't make sense. So, I need to address what the prosecution says is their theory of the case. And put succinctly, exactly, I believe, as Mr. Bailey said, Bob Durst kills Kathy Durst, and Susan made the call to Cooperman. All right, well. Let's look at this. What evidence is there, other than circumstantial, that Bob Durst killed Kathy Durst? Where did she die? Is that proved to you beyond a reasonable doubt? How did she die? Does that prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt? Was it a gunshot? Was it a knife? Was it a bludgeon? Was it a garret? Was it a fall? What's the evidence? Is there evidence? It, if, if you remove the emotions that the prosecution has played upon, that Bob Durst is a bad guy and that Bob Durst lies and that Bob Durst will lie about anything. And look at what the evidence or lack of evidence is 
then you see there's no evidence. The questions, if you are, as you must be, still asking yourself, what happened to Kathy? Where? When? How? And that's reasonable doubt. You can't guess. You have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. There are three principles that are, that are so important to talk about that I want to talk about, and they're all tied together. One is a presumption of innocence, and that is that every person who is accused of a crime no matter who he is, rich or poor, liar or truth teller, saint or sinner, every person is presumed to be innocent. That presumption can be removed only if the prosecution proves and the prosecution always has the burden of proof, beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is guilty. Presumption of innocence, the burden of proof is always on the prosecution, and the quantum of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. And the judge instructs you on what beyond a reasonable doubt is. And so, where are we with that? If you're still asking yourself questions about Kathy, and you must be, because there's no evidence, take an example. The, the prosecution throws in evidence that on the day after Kathy um, the, the day after Bob put Kathy on the train. He went to Calder's store, it's what a general store, a hardware store, near South Salem, up north of South Salem. That's all they proved. That he get, had a, a, a charge on his credit card at Calder's store. So the question that you should be asking yourself is, what did he buy? Does the, an, does the evidence answer that question? Of course not. It's just thrown out there. Ah, he went to Calder's store. You see, circumstantial evidence, if there's circumstantial evidence that has two conclusions at least, and only one of which is guilt, you must adopt the other reasonable conclusion or conclusions, and you have to say not guilty. Now. Tomorrow, excuse me, not tomorrow, but Monday, my good friend and colleague David Chesnoff will address in much greater detail Dr. Cooperman and his receipt of the call from Kathy Durst on February the 1st. And I believe you will see. The, the prosecution has failed in their effort to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Kathy did not make the call and failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Susan Berman made the call. That's what they've set up as their standard. That's what they say they have to prove. Because if Kathy made the call and Susan Berman didn't make the call, Susan Berman didn't have anything to blackmail Bob about. Susan Berman had no way of making the call. And Mr. 
Chesnoff will show you in great detail what that's all about. You remember that <clears throat> at various times during this trial, whenever one of the students that was Kathy's uh, uh, in Kathy's class or with in school with her would come and say, well, I would never call the dean if I were sick. I'd show up or I wouldn't call the dean or I'd call the rotation. But I showed you every time one of them testified the written, the handwritten note from Dean Cook to Kathy and said, Kathy, if you're having trouble, may I help? Contact me. And I showed you the next day memo from Dean Cook to the head of the rotation that she couldn't make, withdrawing her from that, and I might get it wrong, rotation, uh, clerkship, whatever it was. None of those other students had the relationship with Dean Cook that Kathy did, and Dean Cook was the person. He was the Dean of Students, and Dean Cooperman was a Dean of Education. If there was anyone to have a relationship with a student, it would be the Dean of Students, not the Dean of Education. So, has the prosecution proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Kathy Durst did not make the call? I say no. Mr. Chesnoff will spend a lot of time with you on Monday addressing that. I think a pretty good argument could be made that we're here because of Mr. Jarecki and the jinx. And how'd that happen? Let's look at the evidence about how that happened. I thought it was quite telling when agent, FBI agent Eric Perry, remember we had a little fun with him because he and Mr. Lewin had to be roommates for a night. Agent Perry testified that he got a call from someone that he knew as an ex-FBI agent. That ex-FBI agent, as is so common with retired FBI agents, had gone to work for Douglas Durst. A cushy job, as Agent Perry acknowledged. He worked for Douglas Durst and he was asked, that is the ex-FBI agent that was the head of Douglas Durst security, he was asked to contact Perry to see if he could make a threat assessment. By the way, as far as Douglas Durst is concerned, we know, that the evidence is clear, that Bob Durst was free from all of everything that happened in Galveston after 2005. He was on the street, he was a free man until he was arrested in 2015. Ten years with not a thing happening to Douglas Durst or Gilberta Najami for that matter. And so Agent Perry started digging and uh, he talked to an author named Matt Birkbeck, who'd written a book about Bob Durst, who told him that Jarecki and Smerling had been working on the Bob Durst case 
and had 20 to 40 hours worth of interviews of Bob Durst. When did this happen? 2012. So Perry contacts Jarecki. Sure enough, they've got all these recordings of Bob Durst. And so Perry then decides to contact the LADA's office. I think he went through one of the detectives first, but eventually, and this is 2014, they get to Mr. Lewin. What Perry said was, I pitched the case to Mr. Lewin. And that's a term that anybody in Los Angeles ought to know is, I'm, I'm pitching this case to you, trying to convince you to take this case. Well, it, Mr. Lewin was convinced to take the case, and to his credit, Mr. Lewin said, this is not a one-way, this is not a two-way street, it's a one-way street. I'll take whatever information you've got, but I'm not going to share information with you. And he ran with it, and he's not stopped yet. That's how the case got here. But there's a little, little uh, disconnect here because Jarecki had all of Bob's recordings by 2012. There was a two-year gap between when Jarecki turned it over to the LADA's office and Mr. Lewin took it over. Two years from 2012 to 2014. That's how we got here. And I need to talk about these bathroom recordings, the bathroom confession. There's a stipulation in place that says that the jinx itself, as was played for the public, was edited. But what you've heard are the unedited recordings. Mr. Balian played much of them in his argument to you. But there was one very telling one that he did not play. It happens early in the recording, and I'm going to put it up for you, and I'm probably going to do it twice. I want you to listen very carefully because it is very telling also. It's like the first part that where Mr. Durst almost immediately, when he walks into the bathroom, says, there it is, you're caught, and as he's told you, and you don't have to believe him, but it makes sense. As he told you, he realized when they showed him those two envelopes, or actually the, the letter and the envelope, and he saw how anyone could tell that was his handwriting on the cadaver note, that he was caught at having written the cadaver note. But after that, he says at one point, and he's addressing, of course, exactly what Jarecki was questioning him about. He's addressing the Susan Berman case. And he says, I don't know what's in the house. Meaning, of course, now, as Mr. Balian said, he was talking to himself, <coughs> not knowing that anyone would ever hear it. He was telling himself. Can we do that now? That's the unedited part of, I mean, that's part of the unedited tape, and that's the prosecution's transcript of it. Play it one more time, please. I don't know what's in the house. 
except for a moment, except that Bob Durst was coming down to spend some time with Susan Berman, as he said he was, and he arrives to find her dead body. Imagine, imagine the shock, imagine the fright, imagine how horrible that must have been. His closest, closest friend. And she's dead. And she's obviously been murdered. And he panics. And here, see this is, that's the 2012 recording. Yes, there was two recording sessions with directly. One is 2010, the other is 2012. That's the 2012 recording. <coughs> and it's the last recording. It's right after he's been confronted by Jarecki with the envelopes. And he's saying to himself, I don't know what's in the house. And as Mr. Balian says, in those unguarded moments of speaking to himself, he's speaking the truth. And then, <clears throat> as we know, Two years after that, a full two years after that recording was made, is the first time that Jarecki turns it over to the LADA. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Bob's relationship with Kathy, what we do know and what everybody agrees is that with Bob and Kathy it was a deep love from the very first moment. They loved each other very much, everybody says that. They made an agreement before they were married that they were not to have children. Why? Because Bob said, my childhood was such a disaster, I don't want to bring any kids. She agreed at first. And I know that abortion is such a hot button issue that it may offend many of you. Remember this was the late 70s when this occurred. And so Kathy, after finding that she was pregnant, had an abortion. They had agreed to it. She, it, it their relationship <clears throat> was never the same again, but they continued to live together. They continued to love each other. They had the apartment on East 86th Street until Bob moved out at her request <clears throat> for a while. He moved out <clears throat> and lived in a, uh, an apartment owned by the Durst Corporation for a while, and they lived separately for a while, but they were back together. They were back together at East 86th Street after he had moved out <clears throat> when the Peter Schwartz incident occurred. There are several versions of the Peter Schwartz incident. One version, Kathy told, I think it was Dr. Wilk, that she had jumped in on it. Another version, Peter Schwartz said that he had gotten Bob down twice. 
whatever happened, obviously Peter Schwartz was hurt. But what happened after that with Bob and Kathy? After that incident, Bob and Kathy bought the town, not the townhouse, I'm sorry, the, the penthouse on Riverside Drive. And they moved in there together. That's where the incident with Ann Anderson Doyle occurred. Kathy and Bob were living there. They had South Salem where they had lived and were very happy. And they spend weekends there together while she's in medical school. So whether the marriage was irretrievably on the rocks or whether they were trying to make a go of it or whether Kathy was only trying to get a better settlement, no divorce was ever filed. They tried to live together. And that was the situation when Kathy disappeared. Now, <clears throat> please don't get the idea that we're trying to trash Kathy, but the plain facts are that Kathy was having some trouble in school. The records show that. Dean Cook was very concerned with her. It set up a special protocol for her to call him if she had to miss class. You've seen some of the evaluations where either she had to withdraw or she had to take something over again. And even Jimmy McCormick, her brother, a year and a half ago when he testified, said that the family was worried about her and cocaine. This is the late 70s, early 80s in New York when recreational drugs were all the thing. Fadwa Najami tried <clears throat> to make light of it. I hope you caught that. Fadwa Najami, who was Kaberta's sister, testified, and she said that she is, now is, a drug counselor. And when I asked her about cocaine, she said, oh, it just makes you happy. Now, in the 1980s, maybe that was the attitude, but everybody knows, you all know, cocaine is a terrible drug. People can easily overdo it. It's not just a recreational drug. Here in California, marijuana is now, you can buy it. There, there are airplanes flying around advertising. They'll deliver to your door. But that's not cocaine. For a, for a medical student to be out taking cocaine, using cocaine, having a party, and starting a new rotation the next day, that's, that's not being a good student. We don't have to exaggerate and say Kathy's an awful person at all. Please don't misunderstand me. But those are the facts. Kathy's friends said that she was using cocaine. Remember what Peter Schwartz said. Gilbert and Najami brought a bag of cocaine to that party at East 86th Street. And somebody else had bought a bag of cocaine there. It's a fact. And so. Bob had a fight with a guy twice his size who was in his apartment with his wife and others with a bag of cocaine. And the guy ended up getting a, a broken orbit uh, next to his eye. Well, okay, that was a fact. Dr. Wilk testified. You remember, he's the guy that said, well, Kathy came to him and she was shaking and she was scared and, and so forth. But he also testified that Kathy told him 
that she was having to miss a lot of classes because she was having to go to court. That's not true. There was never any court. There's no evidence that either one of them ever filed the divorce. They both had lawyers. No court. Kathy also told him that she was missing some classes due to taking therapy. Remember, Mr. Lewin made a big deal about Bob lying about Kathy doing drug therapy. But Dr. Wilk said Kathy told him that she was missing some classes because of therapy. He didn't say drug therapy. I didn't say drug therapy, but she was taking therapy. What kind of therapy? So we didn't have to demonize Kathy at all just to bring the facts out that she was having some problems in school. Would she have graduated? Maybe. Would she have made her first choice, her first match? Well, whatever hospital she was going to match with would have access to her records and access to her having to repeat some of her courses. They both had affairs. You know, that's, that's not a good fact for either one of them. It's true. They were going through some rough times together, but they stayed together. And again, this was the late 70s, early 80s. <clears throat> Recreational drugs were everywhere. There was a lot freer. Practices. Back then. And, you know, the, pro the prosecution has proved that Bob's treatment of Kathy was atrocious. We told you, and jury selection, even, in, even on the, the long farm stuff that you filled out, there was questions about domestic violence. There would be evidence of domestic violence. That's the way it is. But there's been a lot of domestic violence and not a lot of killing. Many, many marriages have been, had their share of domestic violence. And sometimes the people get past it and go on together. And sometimes they don't. And that's the end of it. But we didn't run from it. We, we asked you about it at the very beginning. And you said, all of you, in the way that you answered the questions, that you could put it in its proper place in judging the evidence. Just as the Galveston jury put in its proper place the awful dismemberment of Morris Black's body and separated that from the, what the evidence showed about how Morris Black died, then you can put in the proper perspective whatever other evidence there is about Bob. Again, my opinion, I think the domestic violence evidence is here to make you hate Bob, and you may hate Bob, but hatred of Bob or dislike of Bob or thinking that he's a liar doesn't substitute for evidence to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt, either direct or circumstantial, that he killed Susan Berman. If, as the prosecution says, they fail in their effort to show that Susan Berman made the call to the dean, then there was no motive. for Bob to kill Susan Berman. 
Susan Berman and he were friends throughout their adult life. Susan was well to do for a long time. She wrote a very successful book. It got uh, got her uh, made her financially successful. She lived in New York. She was financially successful. Um, and then she fell on hard times after she went back out to California and unfortunately hooked up with this guy who took her for all her money and this making a musical out of the, the tragedy that any of you who are history buffs know was the Dreyfus Affair. I, you know, I, 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 had it, I find it hard to think of uh, a bunch of chorus girls dancing around about the Dreyfus Affair, if you know about the Dreyfus Affair. But anyway, so Susan came on hard times, and Bob supported her. Bob sent her money through the years. One of the checks that we showed you is dated in 1999, a full year or more before any new investigation into the uh, disappearance of Kathy Durst. I have to say that the, co the circumstantial evidence is very compelling <clears throat> that Kathy is dead. She hadn't contacted her family. She hadn't been seen. There's no evidence that she's alive. But there's also no evidence of how she died, when she died, where she died, and those are still questions that are not answered by the evidence. So what, what did Bob do? After he put her on the train. Well, first, <clears throat> he took the dog on Monday morning to the vet to be operated on, and he goes in to goes into uh, the city, goes by the apartment on Riverside Drive. It looks like somebody's been there. There's a cigarette in the ashtray and a Coke on the table. And then he goes to a closing that doesn't happen. He's not worried about Kathy because she's um, stayed at the medical school before. He goes back to South Salem. He goes and looks at houses because they, they think they're going to need a bigger house. And they're looking in New Canaan, Connecticut. That's up north. And he comes back to, I think I'm getting this right. He comes back and spends the night again at South Salem. And then he goes out the next day and goes uh, looking for houses, not to the office. And when he comes back, on the answering machine is a call at Riverside Drive for Kathy from the school. It's an automated, well, it's not automated. It's someone saying, Kathy hadn't showed up. Will you please have her call? He calls. It's after hours. And he gets a recording. And now he starts to worry. He's kind of mad because he thinks maybe she's out with a boyfriend, but he's also worried. And so the next day, <clears throat> he calls, he calls around, he calls um, Gilberta, he calls Jimmy, oh, no, he calls Jimmy the next day, I'm sorry. He calls Gilberti, there's a record of that. And he calls the police. And the woman at the police station says, well, uh, is she out with her boyfriend? No, she doesn't have a boyfriend. Well, check with all of, all of her boyfriends. And it's, he gets the brush off. But, but the lady says, you have to come report it in person. That's what he does the next day. And in order, he goes by his, his family, and they say, don't report it. It'll just be terrible headlines, but he's, he, he reports it anyway, 
and he takes the magazine with him so they believe him and and really know that they need to look for her and he turns it over to the police how in the world else are you going to try to find somebody that's missing in a city like New York City unless you turn it over to police they're they're the ones that are supposed to do that and that's what he does <clears throat> detective struck testified um, by conditional examination recording that uh, he seemed to be emotionless emotion uh, emotionless when he reported it well you've seen him Bob doesn't exhibit emotions any of you that have ha had any experience with anybody on the uh, scale realize that that's a typical it's something that's made him appear odd to his friends all his life. He's appeared odd. He's, he's an odd guy. And I'm sure that probably Mr. Lewin is going to say, well, in opening statement, they said they're going to have Dr. Altshuler here. No, we didn't. Lawyers in opening statements make predictions. And they don't always come true. I think that you can see from Bob Durst's 14 days on the witness stand that his compass doesn't point north. He's unusual. And I don't think you need a psychiatrist to tell you that. Did he report her in South Salem? That's the question. Struck told him, call the police out there also. He did. And he had the police in South Salem meet him at the house. And he invited them in. And they looked around. Did they con conduct a complete search? No. They had the opportunity to. They saw nothing out of order. So the idea that he was trying to distract them by using only the Manhattan police, the, the downtown New York City police, is folly. He, he on Strzok's direction, invited the police out there to look, too. A couple of uh, odds and ends I'm going to talk about, and then I'm not going to take much longer of your time. There's um, a lot of the people that knew Susan well said that she was a fabulist. Now, that's my word, but that puts it together. She made up stories. And she made up different stories, different things heard by different people. Different things reported differently by different people. Susan always wanted to make herself appear more important. And so she, and she did have a role when Kathy went missing. She became Bob's PR spokesperson. Because she had experience and she knew people in the business. But she wanted to make herself seem more important and so she built up her importance in all that. But others said, well, you know, Susan would never blackmail anybody. Susan would never talk because she lived by the code of the mafia. It's uncontested that Susan's father, Davy the Jew, they called him, was a mafia guy. 
he took over from Bugsy Siegel. Oh boy, then that's, that's really the stuff of novels. And the stuff of memoirs, by the way, that Susan wrote. But she was six years old when her mom and her dad died. Six years old. You don't get the code of the mafia when you're six years old. Now, she studied and she researched it and she wrote a great book about her dad and growing up as a mafia princess until she was six years old at the Sands and the Flamingo and the whatever other hotels having Liberace play her sixth birthday. But that was an exaggeration. Just like much of what she said to people were exaggerations. And when she said these things, some people took it with a grain of salt. Some people thought it was exciting. Some people stored it away properly and after up to 30 or 40 years of the time that she said anything, remembered what they remembered. And sometimes they had outside influences working on their memory. So that was Susan. And that's not said to disparage Susan. That's a fact. That's what, every, that's what Mella says about her. Mr. Chesnoff will deal with that Monday. He's the one that um, cross-examined Mella. I have, to, I have to say this about what I consider Mr. Lewin badgering Bob for nine days, a sick old man by any terms. We're not, I'm not trying to get sympathy for Bob at all, but it is a fact that he has serious medical conditions. You can see it. I've been concerned that he would last through this trial. But at any rate, everybody has heard the trick question. Have you quit beating your wife? What's a, what's a good answer to that? Yes, I quit beating my wife. No, I haven't quit beating my wife. The problem is the false premise, beating your wife. If you had killed Susan, would you tell us? It's a false premise. If you had killed Kathy, would you tell us? It's a false premise. The answer to that question, well, no matter what it is, makes no difference. It adds nothing to the equation of evidence, except to make Bob Durst look bad. And I'll give this to Mr. Lewin. He made Bob look really bad. But just as the Galveston jury separated the manner in which Bob disposed of Morris's body from the manner in which Bo uh, uh, Morris died, I'm hoping that you will be able to separate your antipathy of Bob toward Bob from judging whether the prosecution has actually brought you the evidence. And I want to talk about their key witness. And I'm not talking about Emily Altman, as flighty as she was. I'm not talking about anybody except Nick Chapin. And I want to show you what I believe is really the most telling part of Nick Chapin. You know, the prosecution hounded him. I think the count is 10 times before he ever claimed that Bob said it was me or her, 
I had to do it. And in the middle of all that, he got mad. Chavin got mad. He got mad at uh, the prosecution for hounding him and hounding his wife, Terry. And let me just go over these things that he said. July the 23rd, 2015. First, he's asked, did Bob Durst confess to you? This is on page five of the transcript of his interview with Mr. Lewin that was played for you, and you had the transcripts with you. No, he didn't confess. That's what Nick Chavin said. The very next page, when he's asked about, well, didn't you tell Terry that he confessed or that he said it was her or me? And here's what he said. This is <clears throat> Mr. Lewin asking him. Finally, he turned to you and he said, it was either Susan or me, and yeah, no, that didn't happen. That's what Nick Saban says. She told me that she said it, and I said, that didn't happen. She said, you told me it did. I said, no, I didn't, and it didn't happen. How could he be more clear about that? Page seven. So Bob, Terry told us, you told her, Bob said it was either Susan or me. Well, that's not what happened, says Chavin. You saying Bob never told you that? Right. Did you ever tell Terry that? Well, no, no, and I told her I didn't tell her. He couldn't be more clear about it, more emphatic about it. And again, on page 10, did you ever tell Terry at any point in time? How could you be more clear about the question? Ever, that at any point in time, Bob told you words to the effect of, it was either Susan or me. No, he says. That's Chavin telling you that he didn't say it. And again, page 19. Mr. Lewin is asking, well, why would Terry say that to us if it wasn't true? And so Chavin answers with a rhetorical question. He says, do you know where Terry works? Well, of course, <laughs> Mr. Lewin, having done his typical thorough research, says, yeah, I do. Where? She works for the Durst Corporation and the Durst Corporation is Douglas Durst. That's Nick's answer to why Terry would say that. Now let's go on. Just a couple more clips. This is page 21. The way Bob speaks, is it a Bobism going to be something like, yeah, it was either her or me? Nick. That does not sound at all like Bob. Page 22. Honestly, it's not the way he talks. Her or me, it's not the way he talks. That's Nick. And then finally, page 33. And this is telling. Nick says, the reason I don't want to come to court is because my business depends on goodwill with his brother who hates him Douglas Durst I want to do everything in my power to have Douglas Durst feel the best about me that's what this is about and so Mr. Lewin argues with him well so Nick if that were true Nick he's a great guy and a good client but Nick Nick if that were true you can hear Mr. <coughs> and you've heard Mr. Lewin saying it this way. But Nick, Nick, if that were true, and Chavin says, I've come to be close to him. Nick, if that was true, then you'd been telling me from day one. And because it would put you in good graces with Doug Durst. And Nick says, it sure would, but it would make me a liar. From the mouth of Nick Chavin, whether you should believe him that Bob confessed to it.
Okay. Let's have, let's have a little stretch. I know you're almost. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got maybe three more sentences, Judge, and I'll be through. All right. I say three more. You know what the <laughs> how lawyers are about their. A lawyer's three. A lawyer's three sentences. Yeah. <laughs> If you have questions about how, when, where Kathy Durst died, the prosecution has improved their theory. If you have questions about whether Susan Berman made the call, and my colleague David Chesnoff will show you to Monday that it's impossible for her to have made the call. Then the state hasn't proved their case. The pro I, people, like, I'm sorry out here they use the appellation, the people. Well, we're the people, you're the people. So I have difficulty with, with that. I prefer to use the state because the state seems to me is all powerful and as I tell my students it is an honorable profession to represent the citizen accused against the power of the state and if you have those questions and the evidence doesn't answer it for you or if <clears throat> you come to two or more reasonable conclusions about where the circumstantial evidence lead you you have to say not guilty whether you like bob durst or hate him whether you think he's a bad person or a liar your duty is to say not guilty and it's your duty if that's the way you feel to maintain that not to compromise you will remember your verdict in this case. You may forget me. You may forget Mr. Lewin. I can't imagine, but you may forget Mr. Lewin. <laughs> you may forget the judge. But you will not forget your verdict. And particularly, if you surrender a reasonable doubt that you have just to get a verdict, You won't be able to live with yourself. Stick by your guns. We'll be here till the cows come home. I had to get something in from, from Texas. And we'll be with you, no matter how long it takes. The judge tells you a verdict must be unanimous, but the judge doesn't tell you that you have to reach a verdict. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, going to now break until Monday. As usual, this Friday's off. We resume on Monday with uh, Mr. Chesnoff's uh, argument and then Mr. Lewin's rebuttal. And we expect that we'll continue into Tuesday and you'll get the case on Tuesday. We expect uh, midday Tuesday you'll receive, receive it. And then you'll begin your deliberation on that day. So that's what you have to look forward to. Meanwhile, in order to do that, you need to stay safe and healthy. Avoid that Delta variant and other airborne illnesses. Drive safely. Be safe. Be careful. Do not converse among yourselves or anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. Don't make up your mind about the verdict or any issue until after you've discussed the case with the other jurors during deliberations. Have a wonderful weekend. We will see you on Monday morning at 9.
sorry, Mr. Lewin? There is argument. Can I be excused? Yes, Miss. There is Justice. argument that can be made. I'm always joking here. Right? And there is argument that is absolutely unethical and unprofessional. Number one, you cannot legally stand up and say, quote, there is a bunch of evidence from Galveston that you did not hear. That is per se misconduct. If a yeah, prosecutor right. did that. Okay, calm down, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Lewis. You're, it's, it's, Stop, it's, shouting. Stop shouting. Stop shouting. Stop shouting. It is not appropriate in the court for you to be shouting. It, you, well, I'm trying to. I am, no, I am, I am addressing your tone, which is not appropriate. You objected. I sustain the objection. I agree with you. Your he Honor, he shifted. Well, you the court you, you, you my are. First three objections, you, you overruled them. Mr. Lewin, sit down. Sit down. Mr. Guerin, do you have anything to say about that? Well, it's obvious that, that they didn't hear all the evidence. I mean, that's, that's in the evidence that they only heard part of what the evidence was. Yeah, it was not a proper argument, and I did sustain the objection. Maybe you didn't hear me sustain the objection. And what I saw Mr. DeGuerin do was perhaps in a face-saving way, he rephrased his argument and said, there are lots of exhibit exhibits, they're numbered to 200, and then he described what they were and pointed to evidence that was received in the case. What he began to do, what he actually said was that there is evidence that you didn't hear, leaving aside the idea that there was nothing stopping Mr. DeGuerin from presenting it. It was improper, I sustain the objection, but you can rest assured, you'll have an argument and you'll have an opportunity to give the last word in this series of arguments. So I agree with you, Mr. Lewin, but I am not feeling as reactive as you to this indiscretion by Mr. DeGuerin. Well, let me finish, Your Honor, because that's only the first. So okay. the court, and, Your Honor, you can You may watch. rise. You may rise. I just wanted you to, to breathe a little bit. And, and you're making an argument. Listen, it's not, you're making a legal argument. You, you feel passionately about it. That's fine. Give me your argument. I will listen. Okay, so here's my argument. First of all, when the court rewatches, if the court rewatches, you did not originally sustain my objection. You overruled it. On my third objection, you sustained it. Mr. DeGuerin said the following things, and they were inappropriate, and the, the court's well aware of it. If I stood up and I for a second said, there is evidence that I know that you did not hear, I would be dressed down, I'd be reported to the bar because it's misconduct. The fact that I know the court believes that this case is overwhelming and that the defendant's going to get convicted no matter what the court said outside the presence of the jury, Mr. Durst has no credibility. And I understand the court's in a tough position. But, Your Honor, the man got up there, and these are the three things he said. He says, number one, that there is evidence you did not hear from Galveston. He then had the nerve, and, and it is just the worst thing I've heard in an argument in my 30 years. He said, let me get this right. He said, quote, Galveston is here to prejudice you, and I believe that evidence should not have been admitted in this case. That is per se, number one, he is saying that the court erred in admitting evidence, which is improper. Number two, he is saying that the court and apparently counsel that we admitted that evidence to prejudice the jury. I objected, Your Honor, and it was overruled. Now, I know that the court understands that that's misconduct, and I know that the court is trying to give Mr. DeGuerin some slack, but imagine, Your Honor, and I'll just ask the court, what would you have done if I would have said something half that way? You would have been irate with purpose and with reason. I don't, I don't get irate. Your so, Honor, Your Honor. No, no, listen, Mr. That's beyond misconduct. Your, your Mr. Honor, yeah, wait, 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 wait. What are we, what are we doing? I, I don't know what, Mr. Chesnoff, I don't, no, thank you. Okay. All right. The argument is not, not correct. Uh, he, I didn't take it. I mean, I know it's the, the, the direct meaning is that the, the evidence was admitted wrongfully, but I, I, I and I do think that, uh, Mr. DeGuerin could have expressed it differently, but it is a way to, I mean, there's, there's no question that the, that the, the, this evidence is it is, <clears throat> let me put it this way, it is not unduly prejudicial. It is lawfully admitted. But I, I had to weigh that evidence 
to make that determination. One might reach a different conclusion and say, this is prejudicial. Indeed, it is prejudicial. It, 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 it does, it would make a juror, any sane person, uh, they would bias them or prejudice them against Mr. Durst. Now, I caution the jurors not to be swayed by bias or prejudice. I want them not to consider it for that purpose. That being said, I think it's fair comment for Mr. DeGuerin, not the way he said it, because I, I agree that's wrong, but the idea that this evidence is prejudicial and that you are, the people are benefiting from this prejudice is, I think it's inescapable. I think it is true that there is prejudice that comes with it, and my job is to dispel that prejudice and to instruct the jurors to take this evidence for what it means. And what it means is, in fact, very compelling. It is compelling evidence, and it is powerful evidence to which the defense must respond. So they will characterize it as prejudicial. It should not have been put that way, but I don't think it's so egregious that I needed to stop those proceedings and interrupt the flow of Mr. DeGuerin's attempt. Let me explain why it was so egregious. It's egregious, Your Honor. First of all, the defense is certainly welcome, and they have a right in their argument to say, we believe this evidence is, is unfair, we believe this evidence is not accurate, whatever they want to say. When they said, and this is a quote, when they said that this evidence, Your Honor, is here to prejudice you, what they are saying, Your Honor, is that either you or us or in combination, it's an improper argument that should have been stopped immediately. Mr. DeGuerin should have been admonished and the court should have been instructed. We want the court instructed tomorrow that, Your Honor, it's an improper argument. The jury. They, they can, the jury insurer, they cannot say that kind of, of allegation. Listen, they went right off the talk top, they want to attack me, I'm a big boy, it's fine. Let's be clear, you want to play, I'm a, just a small time caveman lawyer, that's fine, etc. You're going to get it back on rebuttal. We've got a multimillionaire who's had seven lawyers shuttling in and out of court, and they're going to stand here and sound like they're just a small legal team, that's a direct quote. They can say that, that's fine. What they cannot do is they cannot impugn improper motivations to the court and counsel in your honor. If you want to disregard the direct words Mr. Garen is, is using, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take him at the direct words where he is saying that either the court or the people or in combination admitted this evidence to prejudice his client. That is a lie. He knew it's a lie when he said it. I have no problem calling out as a lie. It's improper. And, Your Honor, in the end, the court made a very reasoned determination why that evidence comes in. They can criticize it all they want. They cannot talk about improper motivations for either the court or for the prosecution. I, I think it has its own consequences. I think a lawyer uh, disagrees implicitly with the court at his own peril. I think it's calculated, but it, it, jurors don't like that. Well, and 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 it's it doesn't go far enough for me to to uh, to to uh, interrupt that speech. But if, if you're free to comment on it, and I think you're, you've got some leeway there on how you're going to comment about it, you have the last word, which well, is why I don't get as exercised about it as, uh, as you would like me to be. Well, Your Honor, and then, and then the final issue, which relates to, again, where we're at right now, is I have a concern. When counsel is talking about evidence that's outside of the record, so I don't know. Now listen, Mr. Chesnoff hasn't done anything. He didn't give an argument today. I don't know what he's going to do. But three different times they talked about evidence that was outside the record. In addition, Mr. DeGuerin repeatedly misstated evidence, which I know the court was aware of. I watched the court. I saw the court notice that it was wrong. I didn't object because in the end, that's for the jury. They understand when he is saying evidence is wrong. But when he says, Your Honor, and this is the third thing, there is no direct evidence in this case. That is a lie. He can say if he wants to, the direct evidence is not credible. He can say that. He cannot say there's no direct evidence in this case. Now, another court's going to say, well, Mr. Lewin, you can explain how there is, et cetera. The court's already said arguments are not evidence. Your Honor, that is a misstatement. It's untrue. Whether Mr. DeGuerin is negligent or he got up there and he just said what he wanted regardless of the consequences, I don't know. 
but no one, I don't think the court's going to tell me that that is a true statement of the status of this case. Yeah, because it's, of course it's false, and, and, and you'll, have, you'll uh, make hay with it, uh, but not in a personalized way, but in, uh, uh, well, I hope, but in uh, discussing what the evidence is. Of but, course there's direct but, evidence. A person's, but, admission but, is, a person's admission is direct evidence. Then we want the court, the, you know, what we're requesting to happen tomorrow is, the and court, tomorrow, you mean Monday. Monday, what we're going to ask, the, what we're gonna ask the court to do, Your Honor, is to instruct the jury that there were a couple of statements that were made regarding number one, that the motivation, that there was evidence that was put in this case. I'll write out the what we're gonna request on instruction, but Your Honor, it is not a cure for the court to simply say, ah, oh, don't worry, Mr. Lewin, you can clean it up. Oh, oh. It was, Your Honor, it was, and the court's aware, it was unethical, it was unprofessional, and it's wrong. And I'm not objecting on the stuff that's just somewhat wrong, getting facts wrong, et cetera. He made three huge mistakes. He talked about his personal belief in the evidence. He told the jury, you don't have the same evidence that I have. I know more than you do. He told them that the evidence in Galveston, you didn't get to hear it all. He tells them there's no direct evidence in well, the case. Well, there's an answer to that, isn't there? I, nobody stopped him from presenting evidence about Galveston. Well, so. well, well you understand that there are answers. There's no, that rule, we, there's no ruling on Galveston. He's free to present whatever he wanted. What, so, anyway, uh, Mr. Chesnoff, yes. I, just not, I just want to hear him out before you. No, I just want to say the following. I plan on talking about the fact that the pictures are being shown to inflame the jury because, contrary to the position of the proof by the state, they were introduced for a purpose to show some scheme or plan, and I'm going to take exception to the fact that that was proven, and then I'm going to say the only reason that they're there from our perspective is to create animus towards Mr. Durst, and I plan on saying it. So I want that to be clear, and I also want to say the following. Well, Mr. Lewin is saying what Mr. DeGarren can't do contrary to your ruling. Every time you tell Mr. Lewin what your ruling is, he says you're wrong. That's kind of the same thing. So I wish that the court would just say the following. We've been here for five months. You've made rulings. There have been many rulings that you know I disagree with, but I don't scream and yell that somehow it's like unethical or improper. And I also wish, after five months, that Mr. Lewin would give the respect to Mr. DeGarren that he deserves as an octogenarian practitioner at the highest levels. Yeah. So I'm because so, so I'm, I'm really, really tired of it. It's really, really okay. tall. Okay, press the court, don't address him. The, the, okay, I think you're out the door because you got your, your honor. You're the, walking I'm ready to go, your honor. Your honor, I'm I'm excuse, I, I, you. I have, as the court is aware, I am prepared. I never have mentioned anything in front of the jury to criticize any ruling the court has done. I've not done, they've done this repeatedly. The court has given Mr. DeGarren slack, whether because he's 80 or he's a Texas lawyer, etc. But your honor, that performance today was completely unethical. It was out of bounds. Is it going to matter? I don't think so. But that doesn't excuse it. It's kind of like you fire into a gas station that has bulletproof glass. And it turns out the guy inside doesn't get hit. You still fired in there. And in terms of respect, people earn respect. When Mr. DeGarren pulls these kind of shenanigans, he gets the respect he's entitled to, which is not much. So I will send the court, Your Honor, the requested instruction. Um, as the court's aware, I really laid off the objections. I could have objected. There were 10 different times where he misstated facts. Um, I just brought up three egregious things. And Your Honor, I don't hear the court telling me I'm wrong. What I hear the court saying is, well, I don't think it's going to hurt you. But Your Honor, all that I would ask is just imagine for a moment, just imagine if Habib or myself had done even one of those things and what your response would be. Is that, I one think of those, is that one of those hypotheticals where the uh, <laughs> premise is not true? All right, so, uh, all right, I will uh, certainly think about this uh, situation. You, I'll meditate upon it and uh, look forward to reading whatever you may send to me Thank if you, you choose to send something to me. Now, <clears throat> I think. Good night, Your Honor. I'll, I'll adjourn. Part one's adjourned. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.